Hey there everyone, I'm Jeff. This is Tabletop Toolbox and thank you for tuning in to the weekly Ratchet. In this episode, like all the others, we're going to talk about some board games, but then I'm going to do something that's never been done before. A top 10, top 10. That's going to happen here on the weekly Ratchet. All right, folks, let's jump into The Ratchet. I hope everyone has had a fantastic week of gaming. What have you been playing lately? Let me know in the comments. Now, in the past few episodes, I've said dumb things like, hey, we should get through this pretty quickly, and this should be a pretty short episode. But this one, I'm telling you right now, is going to be on the longer side, and quite frankly, it's your fault, I'm sure of it. But let's go ahead and jump into it. So some new games that have come in this week. The first one is Cuperium. This is by Matt Cousinow and Steve Castle. This is published by Dragon Egg Games and Whitewater Castle. Now, Matt himself sent me this for a review over on the Dice Tower. You can see it's still in shrink. I haven't gotten a chance to get to it just yet. I'll tell you right now that I think the box art on this game is fantastic. I love the lens flare here behind the text. This is probably box art by J.J. Abrams. I'm not really sure. However, if we look at the back of the box, it's a little less, you know, fantastic. I see a very two-dimensional game with lots of, uh, you know, basic cards, maybe some tiles. But I assure you, I do not intend on judging a box by both of its covers. I will certainly give this game a shot. I am looking forward to it. It is a two-player only game, and that is really all I know about it. So keep an eye out for that one. Up next, I did go ahead and pick up a copy of Ancient Knowledge. I talked about this a few episodes ago. This is a tableau building engine builder game where you have both static and dynamic engine building elements. Some of your engine stays in place and other components of it sort of slide off into history. A really, really good game. I went ahead and picked it up because there is supposed to be a, an expansion coming out later this year with a solo mode, and I think that's going to be up my alley. I'm really hoping. The last one, I am nervous to stand this on edge. <laughs> This is Coffee Traders. This is a capstone game. It is designed by uh, these guys. These guys right here, they have very difficult to pronounce names. This is a really heavy, complex Euro game with actually a fair amount of interaction, quite frankly, that I have played a couple times in the past. I checked it out for the first time in the Dice Tower Retreat 2021, if I recall. Really enjoyed it but a very, very difficult game to get to the table because A, it is quite complex. I think the rating on BGG is well over a four and it's difficult to remember how to play. I, it's a three player minimum. That's also gonna make it a little challenging to get played. This is really kind of more of a collector purchase for me than something I'm hoping to get played. I mean, I'd love to get it played, don't get me wrong, but I love the components in this game. I love the looks of it. It has just this very realistic art style. It, again, it just looks fantastic. I'm sure at some point, hopefully I can get it played again, but I'm just glad to have it. I don't know if it's still out of print. This is a rather expensive game that I got for a phenomenal price here in town. So that's what's new here at the Treehouse. Let's keep moving. All right, moving into crowdfunding games. I said last week that this was gonna be an expensive week, and I did not lie because uh, last week, Ostia Pirates dropped out on Kickstarter. This, as I mentioned, is a Euro game with kind of this Moncala element where you are picking up these little boats in the port of Ostia. You pick up a batch of them in one of these six pie slices. You drop one in each slice after it, just like Moncala. And then the segment in which you drop the last boat triggers an action that will trigger with the, uh, the number of boats currently in that section, at the beginning of your turn two, the section in which you pick up all those ships will give you resources based on the slice that you took those ships from. So there is this really, really interesting element of trying to produce resources for later actions, but then hopefully already have the resources in place for another action. Lots and lots of stuff going on here. I really enjoyed this the first time I played it. I cannot wait to get to try this out again. A fantastic game by Uki Bakoya, a Japanese publisher that really has some fantastic games in their lineup. So I'm looking forward to this one. Also, Ascending Empires. This is a <laughs> this is a 4X dexterity game. Now I talked about dexterity games, I believe, in the last episode. I talked about how I enjoy them, but they can really get overwrought in their rules. 
This is a reprint of an older game, which apparently has not had a lot of changes to its rules. A lot of folks are really talking with excitement about this game. I do like a 4X game. I do like dex dexterity games. So I'm checking this one out. I'm backing it, but I do want to try and get into the rules and see if it's going to be just too overwrought. They're also trying to introduce a solo mode to a dexterity game. I have no idea how that's going to work, but I'm, I'm going to check this one out and try and get some more information on it. Also, today, this morning, Monday, the 4th of March, Galactic Cruise launched on Kickstarter. This is by Kinson Key Games. I can't remember the designer's name. With art by Ian O'Toole, this looks and smells and feels like a Vital Lacerda game because, of course, of the Ian O'Toole art and the big giant box size. I don't think it's going to be as complex, but it is a really neat theme where you are building rockets that are meant to be, you know, vacation getaways for apparently rich patrons. Looks really, really neat. I do want to check into the rules on this and make just make sure that it's going to hold some weight, but it looks really fantastic. Also, last week, my friend Katie from the Meeple Society mentioned that she picked up Hissy Fit. And I, I can't believe that this game slid under my radar. This is a cooperative game with multi-use cards. It's designed by Levi Robertson and Chris Stone. And in this game, you are trying to work with your other players to get a cat into a cat carrier to get it off to the vet. It looks adorable. I can't, I just, like I said, I can't believe this game got under my radar without me noticing it, but I'm hoping that I can check that out when they come to visit me here in April. So we shall see. That's it, let's keep moving on. Okay, here we go with question of the week. Now, last week, I invited everyone to give me recommendations for, you know, a top five or a top 10 video or a topic that I could cover here on the Weekly Ratchet. And literally as the words were coming out of my mouth hole, looking at this camera right here, I thought, you know, self, this probably isn't gonna go the way that you think because as I suspected, everyone had different ideas. Everyone wanted to see something unique. And of course that's fine, I can't fault that at all. But that means that I have 10 or 11 or even 12 different possible topics to work with. Now, here on the Weekly Ratchet, I don't wanna slight anybody. I wanna give everyone's voice a little chance to be heard here on the air. So, I came up with a ridiculously stupid idea to rank my top 10 top tens. I'm going to sort of rank the things that you folks invited me to talk about from uh, not necessarily my least favorite to my favorite, although there's a little bit of that, but also the ones that I can sort of weigh in on least to the ones that I can weigh in on the most. Now, I am not going to do 10 of every subject. Some of these are going to get one at best, and I'll explain why. Uh, I'm going to kind of limit them, I think, to about six or so per topic. So here we go. All right. I'm gonna do first an honorable mention to C.R. Pohl, who asked me for variety and themes of the game of Flux. Now, I'm not sure if he was trolling me here with this one, as he often does with my background colors, but I've actually never played the game of Flux, and from what I know of it, I probably would not like it at all, which is why I've avoided it. Even though there are some sort of themes to the game, or some, some versions of the game that I might enjoy, like South Park or Star Trek, but still, from what I've heard of it, not something I wanna get into, uh, but thanks for the comment anyways. All right, moving on. Number 10 list is from Stephen Chow, a first time poster. Thank Thank you so much for chiming in. And he asked me for my favorite top 10 Alexander Pfister games, then mentioning that he was a little salty at my take on the um, Sky Mines game. Listen, I understand. Unfortunately, I have not played an Alexander Pfister game that I enjoy. As I mentioned in that game, and I'm gonna stand by uh, my comments there, his games are complex for the sake of complexity. I enjoyed the idea of trying to build up businesses or invest in those businesses on the surface of the moon, but the whole idea of where my cards go and then what cards I get to pick up at the end of a turn made no sense to me. It's completely athematic. It's just there to make the game hard, and I couldn't care less about it. Uh, some of those other games are very similar to that. For example, I did kind of enjoy my first play of Great Western Trail 2nd Edition, although it was the worst team I've ever had. Someone just didn't explain anything about the game. I was sitting there trying to read the rule book at the same time he was just yammering on. And I was doing okay in the game until he revealed that the 
cattle that you've collected in your deck, a deck building game where you then sell cows, but then they just go back in your deck. How does that make any sense? Anyways, I digress. Uh, they were worth points. He had never mentioned that the cows you collect are worth points, and so I've been working on this stupid train mechanism, and it got completely clobbered in the game because he had bought a bunch of six-point cows. Okay, whatever. Uh, I then played the Argentina version, which, again, let's talk about theme here. You sell the cows, then you have to feed them to get them on the boat. Then when the boats eventually arrive over in Argentina, you have to feed them again? But I don't own them anymore. Why am I feeding these stupid cows? Not to mention, when I have to feed them to get them on the boat, I can convert money to buy the grain. Fine. But when they're over here, I can't buy the grain anymore. I have to already have it? What? It just doesn't make any sense. And I feel like... I just get this impression of this guy designing a game. He's like, oh, I'm going to have a game where I make cows or I sell cows. Now, how can I make that harder? Well, I could do this. It has nothing to do with the game, but whatever. It'll make it hard, and that's going to be great. So, I don't know. That's where I stand with Alexander Pfister. However, there's one game that I did enjoy. A couple of my buddies, knowing how I feel about Pfister games, kind of had like this dare, like, oh, we bet you we can get you to play one game from him that you'll like. And they were kind of right. And that was Isle of Sky. We played this a few months ago. I actually even won this game, which was kind of funny because I've never won a Fister game. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of like this um, Carcassonne element where you're building out this settlement. You are selling... Uh, you get like three tiles, you have to like trash one, and then you're sort of setting a price on others, which either people can buy, but if it's a tile you really want, you might set the price kind of high. But then you have to buy it, if I remember, if because you want to keep it. And then sometimes they'd buy the tile from you anyways, which that means you have stacks of cash, which is also a lot of fun. So I did enjoy it. There's a bunch of expansions for it. We just played the base game. Uh, and that was an okay one. I'm not going to purchase it because it's just not a game that I think I would ever say, oh, I want to play Olive Sky. But I think I would play this again if given the opportunity. So that is my number one Alexander Fister game. You're welcome. All right, moving on. Fred, another first-time poster, asked me for my favorite auction games. Now, I don't play a lot of auction games, but what I did here for this topic, and I did this for a lot of these topics, was I went on BoardGameGeek, I did a search for the mechanism, in this case auctioning, of course, and then scrolled through to see all the games that I had played. I don't play these very often because most of the games that I play are at two-player, and of course, auction games really need a lot of players to work. And in fact, my number four on this list is Scoville. And really, the only auction that you do here is for turn order, but turn order makes a big deal in this game, which is why I did include it. And you can do that at two players. It works uh, you know, in this instance when you're bidding for turn order, which, by the way, is not my favorite mechanism, but because it is such a critical part of this game, I included it on this list. But Scoville is a neat game. You're moving around, you're collecting peppers. I'm not going to go into the depth on this one. I actually did a playthrough of this on the Dice Tower for one of their Spring Spectaculars, so you can go and check that out. The next one on my list, number three, is Archipelago. I haven't played this game in a long time, but same thing. You're bidding on turn order. This is a big sort of semi-cooperative, but very much not cooperative game where you are, you know, explorers settling the archipelago, exploring it and building up, you know, towns and cities. Really a, a, a very unique game. This was recommended by Shut Up and Sit Down years ago when I first got into the hobby. So it was one of the first games I picked up and trying to learn it was a bear for me. You know, now it's not that big of a deal, but definitely a, a neat game. And I think this one holds up. I still enjoy playing it quite a bit. It's been a while since I've played it, but that's Archipelago. Number two on my list is Downforce. Now, again, you're only bidding here at the very beginning of the game. You're bidding on which cars you want to take into the race, which is dependent on the cards that you have in your hand after they've been dealt at the beginning of the game. So the bidding is only, you know, the auctioning is only at the very beginning of the game, and then you never do it again. But it is nice in that the price that you bid on those cars kind of comes back to bite you in the end. If you spend a lot of money on them, even though they may win, you're going to lose a lot of that money into what you spent in the auction. So that was Downforce, my number two. My number one auction game is Modern Art. This is by Reiner Knizia. And I know that this is not everyone's favorite bidding game, but I really, uh, well, I really enjoyed the one time that I played it. And I played it at like five or six players, which I think is definitely where the game is going to shine. What I liked about it was two things. I like that there's a lot of different bidding elements. So, you know, you're not just running the same type of auction. You've got some where everyone's blind bidding. Uh, you've got some where you kind of go around and around and around until, the, you know, the highest bid is, uh, is, is not 
beat, I guess. And then there's also ones where you just take one turn around, and, there, and there's probably even more. I don't remember them all. So that was a lot of fun, and there's a couple of those auctions where you can even end up winning the card that you are auctioning up, which then you know sort of weighs into how the, the end game scoring works. I also really like the fact that because you're auctioning off these art, these pieces of art, you can kind of get into this role playing element where you're trying to encourage everyone at the table to bid high on this, you know, potentially very valuable piece of art, and that was that was really fun. So that is my top four auction games. Thanks for the recommendation there, Fred. Next up is Yukon Zach, and he asked for deck building worker placement combos, which he put a laughy face there on the end. So again, I'm not sure if uh, Zach was kind of trolling me here with this one. It might be because I may have mentioned at some point that I can only think of two of these worker placement deck building combo games, and that is Lost Ruins of Arnak and Dune Imperium. And I do not like Dune Imperium. That game is popular for reasons I cannot begin to understand. I do like Lost Ruins of Arnak better. They are very similar. I don't care what folks say. There's a lot of things in common between those games. And in fact, if you search, if you do a search on a board game geek and you click the deck building, deck bag and pool building, I think is the option, as well as worker placement, there's barely a page of games that come up. Uh, those two and all their expansions are the ones that show up obviously the most. Of those two, and my number two, is Lost Ruins of Arnak. The reason I picked this one is because really it has one element that Dune doesn't, at least in the base game. I haven't played with any of the expansions. And it is that you, that is that you can sort of combine cards to be able to do something that you wouldn't normally be able to have. The way that this game and Dune Imperium works is that the actions that you can pick are dependent upon the cards that you have drawn into your hand for that round. And that's really kind of all you have to work with. So if you don't have the right symbols, if you want to take an action but you don't have the card for it, you just can't do it in Dune Imperium. In Arnak, however, you can combine cards to let you do something a little bit more powerful. You can also pay money to let you do something a little more powerful, and I like that. I like that mitigation of some bad luck of the draw, and that's the number one reason why this game made the list at all. My number one game, though, and this one did not even cross my mind when Zach mentioned this topic, is Obsession, and I can't believe I didn't think about this because I love playing Obsession. Now, the first time I played it, I hated it, but it definitely grew on me. This is a deck building game where you are acquiring guests throughout the game that then you can invite to events that you were throwing at this, uh, you know, Victorian estate that you own that is owned by your family. And the worker placement element is that when you throw the event, you have to put workers who are, you know, sort of staff that are helping you cater to the needs of these you know, highfalutin guests, these prestigious guests who are coming to your event. So I love Obsession. Definitely my number one for this list. Zach, thanks for the recommendation. All right, God, what number am I at here? 10, 9, 8. This is number seven. Number seven of the top 10 list is from Greg of the Meeple Society, who said, tell me about games that use multi-use cards. You can never have enough of these. Now, I... Uh, this is one of those mechanisms of the game that I'm I'm not like super familiar with. I mean, I know that there are multi-use card games, but I feel like a lot of games that use multi-use cards have another system that they wrap around, right? And so maybe predominantly they are a engine building game or a racing game or a, you know, I, I don't know, a worker placement game or a deck building game that use multi-use cards as an element of the game. And so I don't think of them as multi-use card games, even though they are. So I had to search for this system, this mechanism out on BoardGameGeek, and there are 481 games, according to BoardGameGeek, that use multi-use cards. I have not played very many of them, and some of the ones that are on this list aren't ones that were on that list. So I had to really search through all of these 481 games. Thanks, Greg. But here's what I came up with. My number three, I'm doing three on this list, is actually Lorcana, the collectible card game by Ravensburger. And I thought about this. This is entirely, this is on my own here for this one. You can play these, some of these cards, most of these cards can be played into your tableau as ink. They just go into your inkwell, they're played face down, and they typically will never come back into play as anything else. You then tap that ink throughout the game to get additional cards played, or maybe trigger effects of cards. It may let you, you know, sort of uh, re reuse a card throughout this, you know, through a current round. 
uh, and you can also use that ink to play actions. You can do all kinds of stuff with these cards. The cards themselves can also be used once they're played in your tableau. They can have multiple uses. You can tap them to quest, which is how you get points. You can also tap them to challenge other characters of your opponents, which you know is kind of how you can slow down another player. You can also even tap these cards to sing other action cards which you may have in your hand. You can either play them for, you know, you can play them for the ink or you can let a character sing them to get them out into play. And so there really is a lot you can do with these cards. And, and I thought about that for a reason you're going to hear about here in just a little bit. So I'm going to gloss over that for now. My number three, Lorcana. Number two in this list is Beer and Bread. This is by Capstone Games. I've only played this once, but I did really enjoy it. And I'll be honest with you, I can't remember what the multi-use element of the cards are. I know that you're using them to get various resources. And of course, you're also using them to make beer or bread. This is a two-player game, a really interesting game. I need to get it played some more. My number two. Number one on this list did not appear on the list on Board Game Geek, and for the first time ever, I suggested an a, uh, a alteration or, or an update to the ranking of this game. Its predecessor was listed, that's what made me think about it, and that game is Mage Knight, a huge sort of deck building, uh, sort of exploration game that's been out for a long time, but the game that I suggested, as I've never played Mage Knight, is Star Trek Frontiers. This is by the same publisher, it's, it's by the same designer, it is sort of a reskinning of Mage Knight, and you do have multi-use cards. Those cards are on your ship, and you can use them in different ways to accomplish different quests. You can also use them, you know, to sort of enhance or, or try and get something done in a certain turn to get you to one of those missions, so on and so forth. Been a while since I've played this, uh, and I've only ever played it solo, a neat deck building game, and that's really what it is. It's a sort of this deck building exploration game that uses multi-use cards. My number one, Star Trek Frontiers. All right, moving on. Next one is from Carl Tunist, another first time poster. Thank you so much for joining us here on the channel. He suggested cops and robber games or also detective noir games. Now, I'm just gonna tell you, Carl, I haven't really done a lot of detective games. I feel like all of those detective games are the players versus the game, and it's either cooperative or you know competitive multiplayer, but you're still competing against the game. Maybe you're racing around to try and find your clues to solve the puzzle before your opponents, but you're still trying to you know, solve the game. The game is sort of playing all of you, whether you're doing it competitively or cooperatively, and I just have not found one of those that has really clicked for me. I had Detective City of Angels. I sold it. My wife and I had an old CSI game, a mass market game, but it was one of those where you're racing to try and solve the mystery before anyone else. And they just, you know, we've, my, my wife dragged me into watching a lot of those crime dramas and none of the games feel like those shows. And there's probably a reason for that because those shows are so formulaic that I just don't feel like you can do the same thing in a game and really make it interesting. So I'm gonna then address your cops and robbers. I only have one game for this. If I had to do two, I would do escape plan, but you wanted games where you get to play as the cop, where you're trying to chase down the bad guy. There is one other game for that, which I have not played, and I think it's called Brook City. I have it over here on my shelf to play. But the one that I'm gonna recommend is Getaway Driver. This was an old Kickstarter game. I don't even know how well you can find it, but this is a two-player game where one player is the robber, the getaway driver, and the other one is playing the police, and both of you are deploying various tactics throughout the game to try and you know either catch the other player or get away from the cops. And this is a neat game because you can use some physical elements in your play space. You can put things on your table to act as obstructions. I've played this before on uh, a camping table, you know, an, an outdoor table at a campsite using pine cones and leaves and such as obstructions. It's been a while since I played it, but it was a really neat and a very, very tense game, uh, especially if you are the getaway driver. I really, oh my goodness, was I ever just anxious as all heck as I tried to evade the police in this game. I've also played it as the police, and you do feel like you're a little bit more in control of that, except for that you're really not, because you're trying to sort of corner the getaway driver, but you've only got so much at your disposal and you're trying to trigger things off at the right time, and if you do manage to catch them, then you still don't know which way they're gonna go to, to, you know, to sort of 
get themselves back on track, right? Anyways, fun game, Getaway Driver, my only one of this list, but definitely a good game. All right, let me see. I don't know what number I'm up to. One, two, three, four, five. Number five, this is by Canuck. Chuck, another first time poster, thanks for joining us. And he asked for dice chuckers with complexity. This one was a tough one, Chuck, because what I had to do was I searched for games on BoardGameGeek that are listed as dice rollers, and then I tried a different range of complexities on BoardGameGeek to try and, you know, because you asked for games that were complex, but not with a lot of, not with a lot of, excuse me, rules overhead. And that's really kind of nebulous, right? Because, you know, it, there's a very fine line between maybe just a game that's, again, hard to just be hard, and then a game that uses dice chucking but still has a, a good game behind it, right? A game with some complexity, a game where you're not just chucking dice. This is also difficult because a lot of games came up that are that, that have dice in them, but I would not call them dice chuckers. When I think of a dice chucker, I'm thinking, you know, you're dropping a whole handful of dice onto the table, but then a lot of those games don't do other things with that, right? You're just using that pool of dice to try and do something, and that's really about it. So this was difficult, and here's what I came up with. I've got two games on my list that are not dice chuckers that use dice, and it is Dinogenics, which you may never roll dice in that game, and Vindication. Likewise, you may never roll the battle dice in that game. So they came up on the list. They're not very, very difficult games, but definitely a bit more on the complex side. So my number four is a, an honorable mention. This is Rolling Heights. This is by AEG. And this uh, it's an honorable mention because you're not actually rolling dice. You're rolling meeples, and depending on whether those uh, meeples are standing, laying on their side, or laying on their, their face or their back, determines then what they let you do in the game. Uh, it is a fun game. It takes way too long to play. The setup is a bit of a pain in the butt. I actually reviewed this over in the Dice Tower. You can go and check that out if you're not familiar with it. Rolling Heights. My number three is Tidal Blades, the first Tidal Blades. This is a, this definitely is a bit more of a dice chucker, but also with a worker placement element. And you're trying to move around, you're building up your dice, you're doing these challenges, you also, also have to fight these monsters. The dice in this game look really neat. There's some good mitigation to this as well, which is kind of a crucial element for me when it comes to dice rolling games. That is Tidal Blades by number three. Number two, this one's a stretch, but it is Taverns of Tiefenthal, although I have the original German copy, D. Tavernen, I'm Tiefenthal. Really enjoy this game. This is a deck building game. It is a successor to the Quacks of Quedlinburg, which I hate that game, but this is the same designer, same publisher, I think it's the same publisher, and of course this one's published over in Germany, so when they come over here to the US, they may have different publishers involved with them. But in this game, you are chucking four dice at the beginning of every round, and then you draft those dice, and those dice determine what you're able to do with a tavern in, you know, sort of old Europe. I really, really like this game. I like the deck building element of it, the dice drafting, Definitely makes things difficult. But that's Taverns of Tiefenthal. And my number one game, this one maybe also a little bit of a stretch, this is Champions of Midgard. This is a worker placement game where you are chucking dice representing Vikings that then you're going into battle uh, trying to fight monsters either overseas or local, uh, you know, sort of monsters that are attacking your village. I really do enjoy this game. I haven't played this one in a little while. I also just recently played the successor to this game, which is Reavers of Midgard. I mentioned it uh, here on one of the recent Weekly Ratchets. It didn't really click with me as much as Champions, so that's why Champions made my number one. All right, moving on, number four, my buddy Matt Ball. <laughs> he asked me for my top 10 cat games. Uh, he also asked me for my top 10 games that I would like to play with Matt, which of course would be any game that I can beat Matt at, which is sadly a, uh, a small list. That's okay. My top 10 cat games, I'll give you three real quick. This one's an honorable mention, number three, is Quirky Circuits. This is a co-op game where you're trying to move these little robots through these puzzles and get certain things done. You're playing cards face down, you don't know what they're going to do, and it's sort of a... 
you know what, this game is just nuts. It's a crazy game, and the only reason it made my list is because one of the robots you can control is a cat riding a Roomba you know, vacuum cleaner. So that's why it made my honorable mention. My number two cat game is Cat Lady. This is a drafting game where you're playing out a grid of cards, and then you're picking like a row and a column of cards, and then you're basically just a set collection. Very simple game, but cute art. My number two, and my number one, listen, my number one cat-themed game is Exploding Kittens. I have a ton of fun with this game. My family and I love this game. Yes, it's a little crazy and chaotic and stupid, but it really is fun, and I have always enjoyed playing it. I have just about everything there is for it. I'm trying to find the best way to kind of optimize a good deck of cards, but it's Exploding Kittens, my number one. I'd love to mention Mlem, but I just don't like Mlem that much. And uh, also, you'll notice that Isle of Cats is not on this list. It's because I do not like that game at all. It is... It's too long and too random for what it is, right? It kind of throws stuff at you even late in the game and then you're trying to compensate for. It's very, very lucky and very swingy. And all of that at a game that is way too long and just too frustrating. So I don't like Olive Cats. It didn't make the list. Didn't make the list. Thanks for the uh, the question there, Matt. Number three is from Simulation Chris, and he asked for family games. Now listen, I could go on for a long time with this list, so I kind of had to pare this one down. My number seven is Malem. Here it is on the list. Uh, my daughter loves playing this game. It's very, very light. It's, it's not really as silly, as silly as I'd like it to be, but very easy to teach kids. And with that push your luck element, a lot of kids really enjoy that. So my number seven is Mlem. Number six is Exploding Kittens for the reasons I just suggested. A lot of fun to play. My number five is Cora Quest. This is from Dan and Cora Hughes, uh, who uh, at least were members of the Dice Tower. And uh, this is a really fun, cooperative little dungeon crawler. A very, very light game, but a game that my daughter really used to love playing. We haven't played it in a while. We did get the new expansion. I feel like she may have already outgrown this game, but still a very fun game for younger kids. This, you know, maybe six through uh, 10 or so, you could easily get this played with kids. Cora Quest. Number four, that was five, right? Number four is Planet. This is by Blue Orange Games. This is one of the first games I ever had. A really neat game where you're playing with, I believe they are dodecahedrons, maybe, or maybe. I think it's a 12-sided, sort of a large magnetic die, and you're uh, sticking these magnets on it to build out a planet, and then doing set collection with animals throughout the game. Very, very fun game. Number three is Flamecraft. I don't remember who this game is by or who it's designed by, but it is a beautiful looking game with a surprising amount of puzzle to it, okay? A lot of people are turned off by Flamecraft because it looks so cute and cartoony, but there is a lot of strategic play to this game. You have to sort of be uh, flexible in this game. You have to be able to quickly sort of change your plans with new things that come out that may change you know, your, your best path forward. Really fun game, Flamecraft. Number two is Project L. This is a sort of a Tetris polyomino-ish kind of a game where you're filling out these puzzles. A really neat looking game because of the stark contrast in colors. You got these black and white puzzle tiles, but then these bright, vibrant acrylic tiles. Project L, very, very fun game. And you can now buy, I've seen this, you can buy some of the expansions to this at your regular game stores. You used to only be able to get some of these expansions through the Kickstarter campaigns. Now you can go and buy them at your local game store. Uh, so definitely Project L. And my number one family game is Robot Quest Arena. This is by Wise Wizard Games. This is a sort of a deck building game. The deck building is not the strong element of this game, but you're moving around this play field with these colorful, beautiful robots, and you are just kicking the crap out of each other. My daughter loves this because she can just wail on her parents. But basically, whoever does the most damage throughout the game will win because the damage that you deal to opponents then comes back to you in the form of points. So a very, very fun game, Robot Quest Arena. My number one family game. Thank you, Simulation Chris, for joining in. My number two is from a first-time poster who I've known since I was about 13 years old, Doug Hager from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, asked me the best games to take to a board game day when you're visiting your buddy up in Baltimore. Look, I could go on for a long time about this topic because, you know, when I'm going to a game day, especially when I'm going up to visit with uh, Doug and his buddies, they like a lot of, I'm going to say darker games, a lot of Cthulhu games, some dungeon crawler games, the kind of things I don't really have much in this room. 
they have been playing Gloomhaven, which I have, and I think I've played it three times, and I cannot get it to the table anymore. And it's not really a game that I really, really, really enjoy playing. So when I've gone to visit Doug, and when I go to visit anyone, when I go to any kind of a gaming event, I do try to tailor the games that I bring to my audience. So for example, when I've gone to play with Doug, I've brought games like you know Champions of Midgar, where there's Vikings involved. I've brought Vindication, which is on this list because it has a little bit of that you know fantasy theme, even though it is fairly light. So anyways, this is gonna be a top five list of games that either I've played with Doug and his buddies or games that I have brought to events like that because I know that either they are popular themes with that group or popular themes that, you know, sort of in general, that, that anyone might enjoy playing. So this is a loose list because you could pretty much pick just about any game, right? You want something that's easy to teach, you want something that you can kind of get to the table fairly quickly and that people are going to be interested in from a thematic standpoint. But anyways, here's my list of five games. Number five is Ethnos. This is an area control game that Doug has. I've played it actually only ever with him and his friends. And area control is not my favorite element, but I do kind of like the way that it works in Ethnos. And the last time I played this, I cleaned shop, which was surprising to me, actually. I did enjoy the game. Number four is Atlantis Rising. This is a cooperative game, another element that I think can work very well in these kinds of gaming groups. And actually, one of Doug's friends introduced me to this game at one of these events. I loved it. I now have it sitting over there on the shelf. I've only ever played it one time since. Atlantis Rising is this cooperative game where the island of Atlantis is sinking and you have to sort of build this fantastic machine that will then get all of the, the people of Atlantis off the island safely. And what was so neat about this game, and I'll try not to go at length here, but towards the end of this, you know, there's dice chucking. So there's some, there's some elements of surprise, there's some randomness and some luck. But towards the end of this game, we went from all sitting at the table, I think four of us, maybe five of us, and we suddenly, I, we were suddenly standing. We were leaning over the table of this eroding island like generals over a battlefield with you know, the little flags that you're, okay, we're, where should we flank? Where should we attack? And it felt like that. And when we chucked the last dice, got the last resources, and won the game, we literally all stood back and we applauded. We were like high-fiving. And I have never seen a cooperative game go like that. And that's why I bought it. I think it needs more than two players to work, right? I tried it at two and it really didn't, didn't sing that well. But a beautifully produced game, a very, very just engaging tactical game to play, Atlantis Rising. Number three on my list is Rocket Men. This is a deck building game with a push your luck element from Martin Wallace. Uh, I brought this, <laughs> I played it with Doug. He ended up going and buying his own copy. This is a unsung gem, I think, and not a lot of people talk about this. I think the publisher, Phalanx, didn't really push it very well, but uh, a really good game. Number two, as I mentioned, Vindication. This has that kind of fantastic or fantasy theme, but it is kind of a cube pusher game. It's, it's pretty abstract, but I really do enjoy playing it. And it's a game that's not too hard to teach. You can get this out fairly quick. It's a really neat looking game. My number two, Vindication. And revisiting the theme of Atlantis, my number one game is Age of Atlantis. I actually brought this to play with Doug just a, a few weeks ago. And we had a really good game of it. Everyone was really surprised. And this one's harder to teach. The actual mechanisms of play are pretty easy to teach, but the the sort of the play of it is much more complicated because you've got to compensate for all these different buildings that you're building and it gets into asymmetrical play kind of quickly, but a great game, a game that you'll never be able to find because the, the company kind of just went kaput and vanished, Age of Atlantis. This is by um, uh, Eldorado Games. All right, number one. Of my list, this is by Chad Waller, another first-time poster. And let me, take, let me take a quick moment to thank all of you who commented for the first time. I loved hearing from all of you. I tried to interact with all of you. Thank you so much for weighing in. Uh, Chad asked me for my top favorite heavy games. This is a tough list for me because I really do enjoy heavy games, but they kind of come and go. Sometimes you may think, well, gosh, I haven't played that game in so long. I don't remember how to play it. I don't even remember what I liked about it the most. But anyways, here's my list. Number five is Flotilla. I can't remember who published this game. This is a very complicated game where you are, it's a sort of a post-apocalyptic, the earth is flooded and you're trying to sort of survive. You can either 
you know, focus your game underwater where you're sort of digging for resources, or you can go surface side and you can sort of build out this flotilla of floating debris. You can build up towns and, you know, sort of, then you're buying those resources off the people who are, you know, uh, diving for them. And it's a, it's a really neat game. It's a very, very difficult game to teach, but a lot of fun. I've gotten to play this a couple times. Flotilla, my number five. Number four is Eclipse Second Dawn. Listen, a space game, a 4X game. It's fantastic. Uh, it's, you know, it probably really should be higher on this list because I love this game. I love the way it looks. I love playing it. I really wish I had a solo mode. But number four, Eclipse Second Dawn. Number three is Underwater Cities by Vladimir Suchi and Delicious Games. This game is one of those massive deck of card games like Wingspan, like Terraforming Mars, but is better than all of them. I said it here because of the fact that the cards come out in stages. So in the beginning of the game, you've got level one cards, then you get level two cards, then you get level three cards, and it fixes that element of Wingspan, of Terraforming Mars, of Arc Nova, where you can get a bunch of hands at the beginning of the game that you cannot use until the end of the game, and they just get in your way. So Underwater City is a great game, a very, very tight game too. Number two is Leaving Earth. This is by Joe Fatula. Uh, it doesn't really have a publisher. It was a self-published game. And from what I understand from Board Game Geek, his parents print it on demand from a little print shop out in California. And then they had a falling out. So the game is kind of, it's been abandoned, but you can still buy it. But you may order it, and who knows when you'll eventually get it. But this is a really, really neat game of the space race back in like the 40s and 50s and 60s. Uh, I've only played it solo. It's a kind of a big game. It's, it's based almost entirely out of cards. I did buy an upgraded box. You might even be able to see it right there is the upgraded box that I have for leaving Earth. And there is a mat too that I want to get ordered, a custom made mat that someone did that makes it a little easier to set up. So leaving Earth, my number two. Number one, Whew, my number one game of my heavy games of my number one top 10 of heavy games is Evacuation. I've mentioned this a couple times already here on the Weekly Ratchet. This is also by Vladimir Suchi and Delicious Games, a space engine teardown and engine building because of engine relocation game where you're sort of you know leaving this old planet which is dying and moving to a new planet i haven't played this since the last time i mentioned it on the weekly ratchet a great game a really really difficult game a game that i still have a lot to learn as far as getting better at it but fantastic game that's it i got through it my top 10 top 10 here on the weekly ratchet episode number five here's the question for next week folks i'm going to keep this one a little easier i'd like to ask you what is your favorite board game upgrade it might be something that you've made or something like this uh this box up here that you've purchased uh, and here's what i want you to do go to facebook and you can go to the tabletop toolbox facebook page i haven't really promoted this much but there is a page out there and you can post your image there of your favorite board game upgrade make sure you leave your board your, uh, sorry make sure you leave your youtube username so i can cross reference it to you know the, the names that folks have already seen here on this channel and if you don't do Facebook, it's totally fine. You can also email me a picture at tabletoptoolbox at gmail.com. Again, make sure you tell me your YouTube username so I can reference it with here on the channel. That's it. Let's move on. Okay, we got through that segment and I'm gonna wrap up this video with some quick games I've played in the past week. The first one is not a quick game at all. This is Voidfall by David Turtsey and Nigel Buckle. And I, I feel like I have to prop myself up over this box. This is a very complex Euro game. It's billed as a 4X game. It is not a 4X game in any way, shape or form, 2X at best, but still a very fun, very challenging efficiency puzzle type of game. You only have a couple of actions that you can take in each round. There's only three rounds and you're trying to sort of squeeze every little bit out of your actions that you can. Now, I, I do enjoy playing the game. This last one was quite long. My buddy Daniel, who I played with, was really trying to to beat me in this one. I've, I've won this game a couple times against him, usually with some pretty high margins. No offense, Daniel, buddy, but uh, he really pulled out all the stops on this one. I bested him by just four points. It was a very, very tight battle. 
but still a really, really, really long game. Oh my gosh, just AP everywhere. It's there, there's 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 so many things you need to take into consideration as you're just trying to work with four actions or four turns in a single round. It just it can really really bog down. I don't think I'd ever play this at four. I've only ever played it at two. I also don't know that I'm ever going to get back to it solo, which is the only reason I bought the game because it takes so long to set up. And I've had folks online tell me, you can set this up in 20 minutes. It's bullshit. They're lying out their asses. But still a fun puzzle, a really neat game on the table. It takes up an entire table. You know, it's a game that I'm just, I'm all over the map with because I enjoy it for a lot of its aspects, but a lot of it just frustrates, just frustrates the daylights out of me, including the out of control hype over this game. It's not a masterpiece. It's not the best game ever made. It's fun. I do enjoy playing it, but it's so hard to get to the table because of all the things I've already mentioned. So anyways, that is Voidfall. And off to the void you go. I also got to play over the weekend Cape May. This is by Thunderworks Games, designed by Eric Masso. This is set in Cape May, New Jersey. It's this very kind of cute city building game where you are trying to establish sort of like homes and businesses in Cape May. You have a little figure who walks around this board. It starts off completely barren. There's nothing in place and you have to kind of walk around and build these buildings. They start off as little cardboard tiles and you eventually upgrade them into these cute, but you know, unicolor plastic uh, buildings. And then they will generate income for you. You're trying to accomplish these challenges. The whole game boils down to these challenge cards that you get at the beginning of the game. And you only get a handful of actions. I think there's 12 turns in the whole game. You get three actions per turn. And you're trying to move around and, and get these objectives met. What drove us nuts, both of us, my wife and I, about this game was that you, ha you move this little guy around with these seven cards, numbered one through seven. That's how much movement you get for each card. You have to pay money to play the one, the two, or the six, and the seven. And even though the game starts off completely barren, there's nothing in place, there's a full road structure, and there's one-way streets all over the place. And so <laughs> you have to try and get around these one-way streets so that you can get to these locations to build these buildings. And it is very clear that the only reason these one-way streets are in place is to add challenge to the game. You know, they could have just maybe reduced the, the movement that you could take. They could have, you know, maybe changed the cost. I don't know. But it was no fun whatsoever to think, well, okay, I'm here. I need to get over here to get something done. It's going to take me three turns of movement, one to play, you know, a high movement card, one to pick up all my cards. There's that mechanism. And it, it just wasn't really fun at all. There's also this, uh, you know, you had these like sort of four tiers of locations you're building to, gravel, grass, dirt, and sand. They become more expensive to build in through each tier, but you get better rewards. Except for the end game scoring, the, there's a majority scoring at the end of the game and the sand is worth less points than the gravel, which didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And I won this game only because I drew a card at the very end for one of the upgrades that I had built. And it gave me two extra points, and that was what I won with, literally. We were tied going into it, and I was like, oh yeah, I got this card, it gives me two points, and that's how I won. Very, very anticlimactic. Really no fun whatsoever. This will not be sticking around. The next game that I played over the weekend, well, it was this one. It was Lorcana. I'm gonna stand this up, but it's got a bunch of cards in it, so I'm not gonna, not gonna let go of it. Uh, this is Lorcana. It's a collectible card game. Now, I don't do a lot of collectible card games. I played Star Trek, the collectible card game, back in high school with my buddy Doug Hager, who I mentioned earlier in this video, and then I never touched the CCG again. When this game was announced, I thought, yep, I'll probably get into this because it's a good way to play some games with my wife and daughter, maybe get them into some deck building a little bit, or deck construction. Uh, the, this is almost the entire collection of the first era of cards. I have all the first era cards. I kind of quickly tapered off collecting the second and third era of cards. But the third era did introduce location cards, and I was really interested in checking those out. They do add some neat elements into the game. There's a local game store here in Ashland. They just uh, were purchased by, you know, there's new management in place. And uh, when I was, I actually stopped by to try and pick up some cards and they asked me if I wanted to come down and run an event this weekend. Now I didn't run anything. Uh, everyone who showed up already knew how to play. So I just joined a table and, and played some games. And I actually really, 
had a good time. I really enjoyed it. The location cards add some, some unique elements to the game. Now, the ones that I have weren't all that great. Surprise, surprise. But I purchased some new cards while I was there and got some interesting stuff. You know, right now it's not, it, this game doesn't have the hype of like Pokemon or Magic, even though it's, it's huge. I mean, it sells out everywhere, but it doesn't really have the market. So you can get the cards fairly cheap. Uh, I think I bought a, a bunch of really nice stuff for like 12 bucks or whatever it was. And in fact, even then I kind of got ripped off, but that was okay. Uh, so I'm enjoying Lorcana and I want to see what else it has to offer. I'm looking forward to playing this a little bit more. Last one that I played this week, I'm really nervous to tip this one on its edge. This is Planet Unknown. This is a polyomino game set in space, which I am squeezing for dear life so that the little polyomino tiles in the Lazy Susan that comes in this box don't spill out all over the place. When this game was first, uh, when I first saw this game, I had no interest whatsoever for two reasons. I'm not a big fan of polyomino games, and it's by Adam's Apple Games, which have, they have nothing of interest that has come out before this. But this game really was a big hit. It uses simultaneous play. It's got this lazy Susan that you sort of spin around. You pick a tile that you want to take, and then that lines up with a little marker everyone else has telling them which tiles they can choose from. And then you're placing them on your board, you know, exploring or building out this planet. And then the resource type shown on the tile that you played lets you move up these tracks, and they trigger all kinds of extra effects. And actually, a, a quite fun game. I've played this a number of times. What I really like about it is that at two players or at six players, it's almost the same amount of play time because of that simultaneous play. And I really enjoyed it. I ended up buying this is a retail copy I bought uh, a while back. I think I got this at maybe PAX Unplugged. And uh, when they did a reprint out on Kickstarter, I did an all in pledge. So I will have everything coming in there, a bigger box, neoprene mats, the whole nine yards, I'll be selling this at some point. Uh, but yeah, I enjoy this, and I, I did uh, beat my wife by five points, which was fun. Great game. That is it for this episode, folks. Now listen, next week's going to be another slightly longer episode because next weekend I will be attending RiverCon, a two-day gaming convention here in the Richmond area. I've gone to this a couple times in the past. It's always been a lot of fun, so I'll probably have some really neat games to talk about next week. Tune in for that one. I'll see you then. Cheers. Oh my god, that was a ton of work. My voice is shot. I'm really glad I did the last section earlier. <laughs> By the way, you may have seen me constantly looking over to the side because I kept hearing a noise from my little light shield here, and it was this little bastard. This little bastard.